Good morning, EOA. How are you all this morning? Uh, this lovely, uh, I guess it's a Wednesday morning here. Uh, I'm Chris George and I'm the immediate past president for the SAOP region. I have the wonderful opportunity of serving on the COE board with your uh, EOA president, uh, Dr. Rebecca Stewart. So she has asked myself and uh, I will introduce my colleague, Mr. Matt Don Matthew Donovan from Moorhead State University. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about some tech tools you can use today. Matt, tell a little bit about yourself, sir. Yeah, like uh, Dr. George said, my name is Matthew Donovan. I'm currently the Vice President of Kentucky TRIO. I also am a co-chair of SAOPS Technology Committee, um, and I work with EOC programs at Moorhead State, and I'm glad to be here. Matt is one of our main tech guys in SAOP. You know, in SAOP, we uh, pride in our technology, and as I told Dr. Stewart, uh, when she approached me, I said, you know, I'm not your main guy. I said, you know, our main tech guys. I said, so uh, to uphold the SAOP brand, I'm going to pull in one of these guys with me to make sure I'm not hurting our brand when I start trying to talk about their wheelhouse. <laughs> so with that said, we're going to press forward and uh, just talk. We uh, Matt and I want to do this roundtable format, so we really want you all to engage with us and ask us questions. We've got about an hour's worth of material for you just talking about many different things that are out there, but we want to really be here to answer the questions you have may have within the prompts that we have. But as a fact of our life now, video conferencing software is a fact of our life. And so Matt, you know, you want to talk a little bit about some of the different video conferencing softwares. I put in this slide, what seem to be the most popular, but I know some people are just using like the free version of zoom or whatever, their institution or agency is given to them. If anybody's like myself, they didn't know they had it. I didn't even know I had a free complete Zoom account until March 11th. And then I found out very quickly that I had a free Zoom account and I was expected to use it quite frequently, which I have. But Matt, you wanna talk about some of the different things that are out there? Sure. So people will know everything else? Sure. Um, give a little bit of inf uh, interesting information that I learned last week. Um, Zoom is actually created by a guy who spearheaded the WebEx um, 10 years ago video platform. And he wasn't happy with the way that WebEx was going. And so he created Zoom by himself. And uh, today it's, you know, it's, it's about the national leader right now. Um, but <clears throat> of course, everybody has, you know, the free version of Zoom. Um, most universities have WebEx. I know Moorhead State has their own WebEx account. Um, it's good for conferences and um, having huge breakout meetings and stuff like that. Uh, but not so good for smaller personal ones. Um, of course, you have meetings by Google. Google, you know, is never going to be behind um, the times on anything. So they created their own little uh, meetings um, site. They also have Duo, which uses an Android phone. Um, so a lot of people like to use that. <clears throat> of course, Skype is probably about the oldest one around. Um, it started with just video calls, uh, or sorry, regular calls, and then um, switched over to video calls. Microsoft Teams tried to take over for that. Um, it is very handy for more of the corporate world. Um, I know a lot of people that work at tech um, companies that I know of uses Microsoft Teams for collaborations. Um, of course, you have GoToMeeting and Adobe Connect. There is also um, Amazon Connect out there that is completely free. Um, the professional version is a 30-day version, and it allows you to do just about everything that WebEx and Zoom allows you to do. Um, and it actually is a little bit easier to log into than some of them. Um, it goes off of your Amazon Prime account, um, so it can be able to just easily synchronize and sync up with that. But out of all of these, um, I like Zoom because you can do backgrounds, you can do, you know, crazy little things, and it's easy. Um, like Dr. George says, it's free for the first hour or 40 minutes. Um, and so if you're going to do um, any type of conferencing, um, breakout sessions, um, lengthy schedules of days, you know, if you want to have continuous meetings throughout the, the week or throughout the the day, um, WebEx is where I would go ahead and point towards that. Um, it has it has probably the best platform, and you can also have um, co-contributors. You can have admins. You can give whole a whole list of um, responsibilities to a whole list of people. You can have multiple people sharing screens, um, and so it's a good platform. It is the most expensive platform out of all of these. Um, 
most of the some of these are included in other things like Office 365 gives you Microsoft Teams. Um, but it is probably WebEx is probably the best overall platform as far as like being able to do multiple things at one time. You know, Matt, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I, you, you know, I've had an opportunity. I, my preferred is Zoom just because I think Zoom is the easiest to use. But I, you know, say up uses WebEx and I'm becoming more familiar with WebEx, but everybody, you know, take an opportunity as you look to reinvent your program for the fall, not knowing what's going to happen in the fall, explore the various ones and find out what works for you, whether it's taking advantage of a free account with an Adobe Connect or, uh, you know, some institutions using Microsoft Teams. Um, go ahead and take, a, take advantage of, of exploring because you, in reality, you've got nothing to lose by exploring, um, exploring the various ones and see what works for you. Chris, you want to take a little time? Maybe we can have some people type in the chat box, see, you know, oh. kind of what everybody is using, you know? Yeah, um, perfect. So if, if people just want to go ahead, we're monitoring the chat box here. Just go ahead and just shout out, you know, what you're using. Uh, give us a, an idea of kind of what's popular. Oh, there's all Zoom like crazy. <laughs> you knew that was coming. Yep. You knew that was coming, Matt. Or even if you have any questions about what you're using, you know, here's a great opportunity because we are, from, I'm familiar with Zoom. Matt and Arbo familiar with Zoom. We're familiar with WebEx. We're familiar with GoToMeeting because they are, at one point had a GoToMeeting account. Not I'm not so from I'm not so familiar with some of the other ones, but maybe Matt has some familiarity with. Uh, I think we're all kind of familiar with Skype, and you know, the old standby is still there. You can always Facetime somebody. <laughs> exactly. I don't I don't use uh, iPhone, so I don't I don't have Facetime. But uh, you know those those that do a lot of use it. There's one that um, I actually have forgotten about, and being um, in school right now, I should remember. But Blackboard Collaborate. I yes. Don't like I don't like it, <laughs> um, but we're we actually using that in my doctorate cohort. Um, but yeah, so it's 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 an interesting one. Yeah, I've used Blackboard Collaborate as well. I, I thought it it was interesting. Funny you say that. In our doctorate cohort, we did Blackboard Collaborate too. Yeah, yeah, found it interesting. <laughs> so any any questions in the chat box, or did everybody just kind of tell what they were doing? Did anybody ask a question? I didn't see any. Um, it looked like Zoom overall was the winner. Uh, Teams was co uh, a couple times, but uh, yeah, everybody about Zoom, which is not surprising at all. So uh, moving on then, some things that we, Matt and I, when we were preparing yesterday, we were talking about is another thing is you look to begin to reinvent and think about the future. You've also got to think about what hardware you may need. What do you need? I mean, I, I circled the calendar. It was May. It was March 11th, and March was 11th was the day they pretty much shut down our campus here, and we had to go remote. And ever since March 11th, I've been thinking about if this happens again, my word is be nimble. I've told my staff we've got to be nimble, ready to move, and to be nimble. What hardware do we need? Is what we need to be thinking about. So. Matt and I came up with a list of just some things that maybe people aren't thinking about that they may need to be nimble if we're in a 40, 30, 48 hour, 72 hour window told to go remote again. What may you need? Chromebooks, MacBook versus PC, hotspots, dual monitors. Yeah, all of us have got all of us are spoiled. We have dual monitors <laughs> on our desk. And I realized very quickly, probably within the first week, I was less productive at home because I was trying, to, even though I had my MacBook open on one side of me and my Surface open on the other side, I couldn't move back and forth because they're two different machines. I realized how quickly I missed the dual monitors. <laughs> dual monitors, gaming headphones, you know, like right now, Matt and I have on gaming headphones and it makes a big difference. So if you're at home, everybody in the house doesn't have to hear your meeting. <laughs> uh, charging docks. Um, one that is underrated that a lot of people don't think about is a, if you're doing a lot of web meetings, like right now I'm in my office, lighting's not so great, but at home I've got a good LED light that shines so people can really, so I can really, it, can, it makes a good visual. Matt, talk about some of those things, mainly uh, these Chromebooks, great way, especially if you're trying to give something to students and participants. 
Yeah. Um, for before we start with that, Chris, I would say that one thing that um, another good thing of hardware is is just have a good space where you can actually conduct these meetings. Um, I currently live in a smaller apartment, getting ready to move, um, but I have found out that it is. Um, very vital, very important. If you're sitting down for two, three hours in a webinar, that you need a good, comfortable space, an open space with a big, you know, area to where you can have your headphones, you can have your uh, mouse, you can have your notepad, you know, a good area like that. So that that type of hardware is also as important as the technology hardware as well. Um, <clears throat> but as far as Chromebooks, uh, Chromebooks were introduced about ten years ago. Um, they are very cheap and inexpensive. Um, well, they can be, they have very expensive models too, but, uh, they're usually around 200 to $300 for pretty much a base normal model. Um, they run off of Google, um, Google, um, operating system and they're good for our students because most of the schools that, um, our students go to have what's called a G suite or a Google suite, um, to where they have, you know, basically kind of like the Microsoft Word, the Excel and stuff like that, but the Google version. Um, and you can also create Google Classrooms as well to use with these Chromebooks. So they don't use Word and they don't have a Windows base to them, but they have more of a mobility base to them. Um, and it's basically, you know, what you, when you bring up Google Chrome um, on your computer, no matter what computer you have, that's basically what a Chromebook is. And then you can just access the G Suite um, through that browser there and it allows them to do everything. You know, you have Google Docs, you have um, just all kinds of different programs that each student can use. So like, like um, I was saying, they're very cheap and expensive. I know a lot of programs have switched to buying some of these and loaning them out. Um, and so their students can do their schoolwork or they can, you know, do their upward bound summer programs. Um, and so they're very, they're a very handy tool to use and you don't have to worry about that thousand dollar laptop, um, you know, and having to spend all that money on, on just maybe one computer. So for one Mac, you can probably buy about five Chromebooks. Um, so again, they're very good, very cheap and inexpensive. Yeah, and you know, really do your homework because everybody makes a version of a Chromebook. We yeah. bought we bought ten this uh, this spring for the office, and I thought a Chromebook was a Chromebook. I was like, just get some Chromebooks. And yeah. Quickly, I found out everybody has their own version of a Chromebook, and you've got to go do a lot of homework on the Chromebook. And it really depends, like Matt said, it really depends on what you want. I, I would recommend probably the best base brand um samsung probably makes the best um chromebook google actually put out their own versions they're a little expensive without giving you some of the things that you may need um, but samsung's base version is probably about the best chromebook that you can buy and then you know you come into the age old mac versus pc <laughs> and that really has a lot to do with your individual campus i mean i know campuses have gotten better about having technology folks that um, can support all all platforms, but it really depends, you know, are you comfortable trying to bounce back and forth between the Mac world and a PC world, or do you want to stay in one world? And, you know, uh, I, I don't really have a preference. I have mostly, app, most of my devices are iPads, Apple, uh, MacBook, but, you know, we're a PC campus, and so I use a PC. I use a PC at work, so I'm just as fine right now. I'm actually doing this on the Surface Pro uh, simply because the Outlook supports it, right? And during this time being at home, I would rather my email look like it looks on my desktop <laughs> on my Surface. So it has kind of pushed me a little bit away from my uh, from my MacBook here lately. But, you know, that's an age-old argument uh, that you need to understand and where you fall in on that. But as you think about hardware you may need, you know, as you get ready to go in the fall, your staff may need, you know, you need to look at the status of your equipment. And if you need to upgrade your equipment, be ready, you know, make sure your staff, that is a great way to spend some of your funds is to make sure your staff has a good workable device. I'm a strong advocate of Surface Pros. I think they are just good, solid machines that uh, give you a two-in-one type feature if you want to operate it a little bit like a tablet, but then you get the all the um all the perks of it being a pc as well so that's one thing and like i said it's just very dependable easy to use any thoughts on that one matt yeah i would say that um 
I, I'm kind of like uh, with Dr. George. I have a lot of Mac stuff. I don't use an iPhone, but I do have several MacBooks and an iMac. Um, the one problem that we I found out um, with um, internet calling and, and video, Skype and stuff like that is that a MacBook locks down a lot of things. And so if your institution that buys your MacBook, they may go ahead and lock down a lot of stuff so you won't be able to share your screen or you won't be able to access some of the features. Whereas a PC um, already has a lot of that built in and don't have to worry about a lot of those permissions. Um, and so, you know, just look at just how, what usability functions you're worried about. Um, you know, of course, with a MacBook or, a, or an iMac, you can um, share with an Apple TV. So maybe if you have one of those, you can create a larger space. You know, you can create a huge second screen with your television. Um, but I would just look at, you know, cost, what your functions are. You know, it's, you know, I grew up, you know, IBM's was the business laptop and, you know, now they're Lenovo, same thing. It's hard to beat a Lenovo for the price point and what, you know, most common users use. Um, but like Chris said, a, a Surface is amazing. You don't have to buy the iPad in the, in the laptop. You already have that, you know, in a Surface Pro. Um, but it's, it's, it just depends on preference and, and the campus usability. And, you know, I've noticed, Matt, uh, one of the things I've noticed is, through all of this, anytime I go to do something on my Mac, if I'm using my, that it has gotten annoying about the permissions. Yep. Um, how annoying the permissions has gotten. Can you take the lead for just a second, Matt? Sure. If you're talking about the slides, let me answer this phone call. Sure. Uh, so next we're going to look at hotspots. Um, as me and Dr. George were talking yesterday, um, we realized how important these hotspots are. I live in Eastern Kentucky, and so high-speed internet is not uh, very prevalent um, with our students and stuff like that. And so a lot of times you have to be able to um, show them how to use their phone as a hotspot. Because while not every kid has a nice laptop, um, just about every kid has a pretty decent phone. Um, that I ever run into. And so a lot of times with AT&T and Verizon um, or T-Mobile or whoever else um, you have, um, they have the option of turning your hotspot or your phone into a hotspot. And 4G LTE is pretty good. Usually that's a lot faster um, than say like um, we have Windstream here, which is a DSL type of uh, internet connection. A lot of times it's faster than that. Um, just got a question in the box. Are hotspots secure? Yes, hotspots are secure. You can give them passwords. Um, and so when you connect to it, it's just like connecting to your router. It's going to give you a name. So like mine is just called um, Samsung Galaxy. And you click on that and then it'll ask you for a password and you can create it or it gives you one that's like 110 characters, which is huge to uh, connect to. Um, but it is very secure as long as you put that password on there. And out of the box, most of them are going to require a password. Um, so they're really good to use. And I think mine allows five dot devices at one time. Um, and so you're talking about having a, 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 a slower cable modem connected. So it's not going to be as fast as like your cable internet or your um, home office internet or your school. Um, but it is going to be pretty much if you're doing web-based stuff and some video stuff, it's going to be able to handle it just fine. So those are a good thing to put out there. A lot of times you can find that um, the little actual fobs of the hotspots you can get from AT&T or whatever for relatively cheap, if not free, um, when you sign up. But you know, like I said, most of our students have phones. iPhones are very easy to make hotspots. Samsungs are even easier. Um, and so, you know, just making sure that you show your students or your employees um, how to use these hotspots, how how to uh, make them secure. And, you know, that would be a good tool to use, especially out in the field uh, once we do get to go back a little bit or, you know, at the student's home um, where they don't have proper um, high speed Internet. Yes, I agree, Matt, 100 um, percent. We, you know, that was one of the first things we noticed with students, you know, dealing with uh, college based students, a lot of them were accustomed to having the campus internet available to them and now they've got to figure out what to do. So immediately we were like, uh, one of our staff members just like started teaching students, telling them on the phone, this is, you know, use your hotspot on your phone, you probably don't know it's there. Here's how you do it. And that was able to mitigate some of that digital divide for some of them, not all of them. Now we're serving students in rural areas. 
they could still have issues because maybe their sales service isn't that great. But, um, but um, you know, that's something to think about. Just like dual monitors, like I said, you know, we're all accustomed to that dual monitors where we just drag things from side to side, keep your email open. It really makes you more functional. I've always read and heard that a dual monitor makes you about 30% more effective than you are with just a single monitor. With that said, there are a lot of good monitors out there. I mean, just get on Amazon and type in a travel monitor. You're going to see a lot of good dual monitors that are plug and play. I mean, when I say plug and play, what I'm saying to you is you plug up the uh, USB-C to USB-C and it goes. No, so Nothing to download, nothing to do. You're just, you're just ready to cook. Um, be careful. I tried to buy some for my staff and had to buy some different ones because that is one of the things I found with the Surface Pro. The Surface Pro doesn't have a USB-C um, attachment. It used mini display port, which is a different port. And it didn't like the monitor I wanted for them to use. So I had to get a different one. So kind of do a little bit of homework and see, and just see, um, make sure you got the right connectivity on that. But if you can find something that plugs up uh, HDMI, you're going to be fine. And like I said, right there on Amazon, you're looking at about $200 for this travel monitor. But even think about it, if you're a talent search, an upper bound or an EOC, potentially, that's something you can put in the put in the bag and take with you and make yourself more productive when you're out in the field. I think it's a great expense that would be an allowable cost. Matt, what, what are your thoughts on gaming headphones and why gaming headphones over just like plugging in your AirPods or just some um, or plugging in your uh, just regular um, things that come with your phone? Why, why really gaming headphones? I, I know that's one thing we like to tell people to get is go ahead and get you a good set of gaming headphones. Um, I was I would say it's because just the comfortability, um, you know, gaming headphones are made for you to wear for a very long time. You know, um, if you watch esports and um, stuff like that, you can see that these people are wearing these headphones for five, 10 hours at a time. Um, whereas if you wore like AirPods or Galaxy Beats or or something, you know, those are inside your ear in your canal and causing a lot of issues and you can actually get tinnitus out of it um so gaming headphones are more comfortable um they're also better at noise canceling you have a mic right here you know this mic gets close to your mouth it's going to block out most everything um that it hears around it um i know we actually had this issue come up when we were trying to play music over my computer to everybody else well my headphone wasn't picking up because it didn't recognize my voice um it only recognized the computer audio and it's like no this is not something we want to let through so that is another good thing um, whereas stuff like you know your headphones that come with your phone um, or airpods they tend to allow a lot more ambient uh, noise um, come through and so it's a lot more distracting um, and the good thing is is that you know um, apple airpods can cost about 200 bucks these gaming headphones you can find easily for around 35 40 bucks i think the ones that me and dr george got are about 60 bucks i think is what we yeah. paid for them um, and so you know they're relatively inexpensive they're very durable they hold up well um, and they attach to just about anything you can get the three and a half um, millimeter jack which is just the regular headphone jack um, or you can actually get the usb um, port which is currently what i have um, and then they can fit into any type of computer the cord's long enough you have a different little control um, you can lower your mic you can mute yourself um, so you can all do that just from a, a little handheld thing kind of like this um, that way you don't have to worry about doing it on a computer. Um, that way you have a little more space between you and the computer. Um, and so just overall there, I think they're just a lot more easier to use. You know, you're not listening to music. You're actually being productive when you use these. And so they have a little bit more, um, you know, diverse um, capabilities than what a um, uh, AirPods or something would have. And another thing I like about Matt, I know everybody sees all the people on the news, you know, they've got their AirPod in yep. and I'm thinking, I know they think they look cool because they got an <laughs> AirPod in, but I'm like, you're not being functional. Mm -mm. You're not being practical. You're not here to look hip and trendy right now. You're here to uh, get a job done. And I think the microphone, the extended microphone is the big thing because you're trying to have a conversation and you want people to hear you. And sometimes with an AirPod or an EarPod, People can't hear you. No. And uh, can, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. 
the people on the news, you got to think they have a close set. Um, they don't have anything going around them. Um, I don't know about you. I have kids, um, but you know, everybody, you know, you always got this time of different noise that goes around and, and, you know, you could have your TV, your cell phone or whatever. And so this helps prevent that um, distraction and that extra noise. And like we said earlier, lighting is key. You know, if you're going to be in a dark room, you know, try to really get on camera and take a look at what things are looking like. And if you're not, you know, sometimes maybe it's just best to to dim the video and just turn, stop the video and just go with a picture or whatever. But if you're going to be live and you need to be live so you can see people and interact people, think about um, think about getting you a good LED light. And once again, we're telling you things now. The, the MacBook, the PC is probably the most expensive thing we've talked about. A good LED light is going to cost you 20 bucks, And it's something you can use later too. Ladies can use it later for makeup guys could use it when they're shaving, you know, there's uses for it later for a good led light in a dark room. So if you need to, you know, think about getting a good led light. And I'm going to say lastly, uh, as we move forward, you muted yourself, Chris. So, um, lastly, before Matt talks about digital signatures, cause this is his thing. Um, I want to say, think about when you're in online meetings, we're talking about the microphones and the visual. Studies are, and research is starting to say as we've been going through this pandemic that a two, that two hours in an online meeting is probably the equivalent of four hours in a face-to-face -face meeting because you are working harder in an online meeting. Yes, you know, you might be sitting in your house at your kitchen table on your back patio, but your senses are working harder because you really can't see and interact with other people. So you're thinking harder about what's going on and you're thinking about when you're in an in-person meeting, you don't think about how you look in the in-person meeting because you can't see yourself. When you're in an online meeting, not only is your mind worried about the meeting, you're thinking about how you look on the camera. So it's taking more out of you. That's why you're tired after online meetings. I've heard people say, I'm just, I do, I did two online meetings a day and it's noon and I'm exhausted. Well, you're exhausted because you went three hours and you were thinking about 15 other things outside of just the meeting. Whereas if you're in person, you're just thinking about the meeting and your mind may be wondering, but now you're looking at yourself on camera and you're watching other people's on camera and you're watching everything that's going on. So you're expected to be more exhausted. Matt, take digital signatures. That's all you. I got, I got nothing. <laughs> so, so before we go on to that, Chris, um, let's see if anybody has any questions about the hardware. Um, if anybody has any type of like little tidbits they want to share or, you know, what they seem best. Um, have they found a headset that works better? Um, just any type of questions anybody wants to ask, feel free to drop that in the chat. And then um, we can go ahead and talk about that before I move on to digital signatures. Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and move on to digital signatures. Um, so when COVID first hit, uh, one of the first things I tried to figure out was how, you know, we all have forms that the federal government says we have to have filled out from each participant that we serve. And so um, I, I wanted to see how I can make my, you know, carbon copied pink, you know, registration form into something that's digital so I can get my people that I'm serving through Zoom or Skype or whatever um, or the telephone to fill out and send back to me. That way I can capture the, their information and use that and be able to count them. So the first thing I did, I use a lot of Adobe products and I know how to create a P, an editable PDF form. And so what I did was I scanned our form, created it into a, as a PDF and then use Adobe Signature to capture their signature. And usually it's really easy to use um, on a cell phone, on a laptop, on a desktop, or an iPad. It's very easy to go in there, put in your signature. It shows a timestamp when you save it. Once you save it and put your signature on it, you can no longer edit it anymore. Um, and so that is a very good way to capture a signature that you don't have to worry about the federal government saying, no, this is not true. So in one of the COE talks, I had actually asked um, the question about this, and um, I'm forgetting her name, Dr. George. 
the head of COE. Maureen, Dr. Maureen. Um, Dr. Hoyer. Maureen Hoyer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. President Oiler. Um, so she said that, you know, if you can capture it and it shows a timestamp, then you're good. The federal government will accept it as a, as a signature. Um, once that I did that, I looked at another way because some of the people were having a hard time opening it because they didn't understand PDFs as well. And so I looked at JotForm <clears throat> and JotForm, just a simple little basic um, web-based form that you can have your students fill out. You can capture your social security. You can capture date of birth. It's 100% secure. And then when they submit that, and it adds their signature and a timestamp. Um, and again, that right there, you can print it out. It creates its own little database of everybody that's filled it out. And that way you can go ahead and turn those in as your numbers and student participants um, throughout. There's also um, iSign, which is a small program. Um, it actually costs, it's not free, um, that you can get, that you can add to any type of um, form. And all they have to do is open that up. You send it to them in an email link. And once they get it, they just type in their name or use a little the mouse to draw a little thing. And it saves it, puts it on whatever document you put out there. Um, so there's just there's a couple um, good ways that I've seen. I'm sure there's other ways out there, um, but I just know that that Adobe Sign um, and um, JotForm are two of the easiest, best um, ways that you can actually create that. Uh, JotForm was the second one that I named. Um, just J O T um, F O R M. Um, and it's a very good program. I know we use it for several things. Um, I know when we ask for meetings and stuff like that, we use it. Um, the Upper Bound program at Morehead State uses it to capture student information and also different things that they have to do throughout the school year. Um, and so it's a really good thing to use. And, and, you know, most people, if they know how to use Adobe, it's not that bad, you know, Adobe Reader is free. Um, and so, but JotForm is also a little bit more friendlier to use. Um, that way you don't have to go in there and actually create the digital PDF. Um, but that's about it on digital signatures. Does anybody have any questions um, besides um, Adobe Reader or JotForm? Uh, those were the two, Matt, they asked, someone asked, so I went ahead and uploaded those into the chat so Chris, do you guys see. use job form we uh somebody mentioned docusign, DocuSign. Uh, actually we do not use job form for whatever reason wku thinks job form is <laughs> spam so anything like stephen king sends to me yeah doesn't send it to me separate in my another email because wku kicks anything that's job form i called it and they said it, that their system considers it spam for whatever reason. So uh makes it a little difficult. Cause I actually like JotForm. I end up using, but I know it's not a digital signature possibility, but uh, for a lot of times that I do a form, I have to do it in Google Form. Yes, Google Forms is another one. And as long as you can capture a date um, of submission and buy a person's email address or something like that, you know, that's going to be good um, to use. Uh, so, like we said, another person said DocuSign. DocuSign is another good program. Um, very easy to use. Kind of looks like JotForm a little bit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's there's all kinds of different programs out there. Um, I know that those two and then plus DocuSign have been talked about at COE um, and how you capture that digital signature. And, again, as long as you can get a timestamp um, and it can't be changed, um, COE said that the Department of Ed is going to use that as a signature. Ooh. Told you that's Matt's wheelhouse. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're really excited for when we got Matt um, because Matt brought us finally a digital, you know, most of our tech guys are upper bound or SSS. Matt is, Matt is unique because he is a tech EOC guy. <laughs> and a lot of times our EOC people are asking about, uh, and VUB people are talking about tech issues and none of our tech guys can really answer them because they think in a pre-college college world and not necessarily an adult learner. So that was very quickly, we were like, Matt, come on, because <laughs> the EOC and VUB folks are gonna love you because you think the way they think and you think about making technology work for them. So, and that, that is a big one in our EOC VUB community 
who are out a lot and sometimes need to get a digital signature. So we are really proud that that's Matt's wheelhouse. Yep. Yeah, you know, adult learners are a lot different than college students. And so anytime that you can, you know, tackle uh, some of those diverse and, and um, different issues that they have is great, you know. Um, so you know, I'm great that we can bring an EOC into the 21st century, you know. So we've already talked about uh, phones as hotspots. We got a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, but also something else Matt and I wanted to bring up to you is, you know, really take advantage of the free things that are out there and knowing what's going on. Um, you know, Comcast Internet Essentials has a partnership with COE. And if your area is a Comcast area, your students can take advantage of Internet Essentials. And that's giving them free Internet. I know I hated it because of COVID. They had to suspend the, uh, the PC purchasing program. Uh, because of the demand, but you know, Internet Essentials is still out there. Matt, can you grab that question and I'll keep gabbing along, see what it is. Somebody popped up in the box. I don't see one, Chris. Yeah, one said it had a one. Yeah, it's one. Uh, uh, she says, is Jot Form, uh, Molly wants to know if Jot, she asked me privately, that's why it popped up for me. Okay. Is Jot Form accepted by the Department of Ed, Matt? Yes, it is because it captures a timestamp of when that signature was set up and only that person can do it and it can't be changed. So yes, it is. And then we had, uh, and then a lot of people were not aware uh, when we first entered into uh, a lot of NTI instruct, non-traditional instruction and work from home, Spectrum also had a free internet program that I don't think that didn't get the, um, amount of publicity in the trio community that um, that Comcast Internet Essentials did, for, but that helped some areas that were spectrum areas. So, you know, really know about these things and those are resources for your students and your families, because I really believe for our pre-college kids, they're going to be facing some NTI again next year. And you all are going to be, you know, our pre-college folks are going to be trying to figure out how to get to their students. And sometimes it's a little harder for them because they can't get in their car and go sit in McDonald's parking lot and grab some free Wi-Fi or go sit in um, Chick-fil-A, I mean, uh, not Chick-fil-A, but a Starbucks parking lot and grab some free Wi-Fi to do what they need to do or can't easily get to a friend's house. So really think about these programs. I mean, I know I, I'm also an online instructor and I had, I'm always online and still with my online students, I had to make changes because a lot of them were talking about, I'm, I depend on the internet at the campus. I depend on the computer lab. So, you know, normally I'm very strict about tests. I had to leave tests open a week longer because somebody, but you had, they had to work with me to say, Hey, I can't get to my neighbor down the street to my neighbor to use their internet for a couple of days. And, you know, if anybody's like me, probably like Matt, my home internet's on super lockdown <laughs> and you know, sometimes you can't, you know, back in the day, people just left their uh, Wi-Fi network wide open and, you know, you could steal a neighbor's internet sometimes, but you know, like, like now everybody's got their stuff on super lockdown. So you can't even steal a neighbor's internet these days. Chris, we got a question about elaborate how the phones can be used as hotspots. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me see if I can get this here. Um, I will show you how to turn a phone into a hotspot. So if you have Samsung devices um, or Google um, Android devices, there is going to be a icon. Let's see if you can see that right here. And it says mobile hotspot. And so you just click on that. I'll do that. You click on the icon that says mobile hotspot and then it will turn on a little thing like this. And this is where we were talking about, let's see if I can, yep. I can see it, Matt. Okay. So this is where we were talking about if it's secure. So see here, you're going to have a name and this is going to be the name that you look for just like a Wi-Fi. Like if you were actually looking at your home Wi-Fi, it would have whatever name you set up. So this will have an actual name. And so you just browse for that and then it will ask you for a password and I'll change this today, but so I created <laughs> in on this page where it shows you the name, it'll also show you the password. And so you just go ahead and type in that password um, like you would if you were at home. Um, and then it connects to your hotspot. And as long as you have cell phone service, 
um, you have a hotspot. And like I said, I think AT&T or Samsung allows five. I think iPhone is the same thing. I think it's five as well. Um, and so it just uses your data. So if you're one of these people that have unlimited data, um, then you are able to, you know, use it unlimitedly. If you have, saying, can you show what you clicked on initially again? Sure. Are you, uh, Debbie, are you an iPhone or are you an Android? Because if you're an iPhone, it's Android. Different. She's okay. an Android. Good. So, you know how you access like your Wi-Fi and your Bluetooth. So you just pull down. Okay. Well, on mine, you just pull down a little bit more. And then there's the, the hot, sorry. So there is the hotspot icon. And all it looks like is a little piece of paper with a Wi-Fi signal. Um, and it says mobile hotspot. If you don't go through that way, if your phone doesn't have it that way, then you can go through it through settings. Um, and I think this is how you do it um, on iPhone as you go through. Yeah. Or iPhone. Um, okay. I've got a, I've got a background so you can't see. I'm sorry. <laughs> so iPhone, you just go to your settings and once you open your settings, you're going to get the basic settings screen and you're going to see personal hotspot. You just turn turn it on to where it says allow others to join. You'll have and then you'll have a default password. It's very simple. The connection instructions are right there. Yeah, it and uh, it's a great way to use um, a lot of times. And hey, this is not just a thing you can use. Um, not just something to use now for work. You think about it as you travel. Sometimes I, uh, a lot of people don't think the hotel internet is very secure. Yeah. Uh, and they'll just use the hotspot on their phone instead of using the hotel internet. Or think about when you're sitting in the airport and you need to do a little bit of work and you don't want to do those free airport Wi-Fi's. I hate those free airport Wi-Fi's because I definitely don't think they're secure. Um, now, even though I travel with a true hotspot, sometimes I don't want to dig in my, sometimes I'm lazy. I want to <laughs> dig in my bag. I mean, I know, I'm, and anybody that knows me, Dr. Stewart, anybody else, uh, I don't know any of my other EO friends on here. You know, my, my tech bag is is uh, substantial, but sometimes I'm a little bit too lazy to get down in that tech bag and get uh and get out my hotspot. So I'll just flip it on on my phone real quick and use whatever. So it's a great thing. Uh, once again, in the car, think about when you're on a road trip with your family and you need some quick internet. That's a great way to turn that on real quick and get some internet and power up a laptop or an iPad and get you some internet on that and not have to use your phone. Uh, uh, underrated thing, it's an underrated tool that you have in your pocket that most people don't take advantage of is that hotspot. Yeah, until about four years ago, um, if you had an iPhone and you had AT&T, you couldn't use it as a hotspot um, because they didn't want you to share your data with everybody. But I guess now with you know the mobilization and, and phones getting a lot different nowadays, they decided to, you know, if you want to turn on your hotspot, you can. Well, now wait a minute, Matt. <laughs> you could. You just had to jail your phone. You know, had yes. to try to jailbreak it. Yes. We're not here to talk to you how to jailbreak it. <laughs> that's not what we want you to do. Yeah. Yeah. All in fun. All in fun. Android people pick on Apple people. Apple people pick exactly. on Apple people. That's what we do. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I'm big into is still uh, as we move forward is a way to um keep doing things you would normally do virtually whether and you know i know right now a lot of the upper bound summers are trying to do as much as they can but a lot of our vendors that are at our conferences have really jumped in and tried to come into a tech world well matt and i are both in kentucky and kentucky trio had a virtual spring meeting and we were very excited to figure out how you know one of the things our state president said is i want vendors and when he said, I want vendors, I was like, dude, I don't know how that's going to work. But, you know, the vendors were ready to go and they want, they still want to work and they still want to help. And so here are a list of some vendors. If you need some virtual workshops done from a vendor that could really get in there. Uh, Mr. Ronnie Thomas with Fun Weird Science came on, did a couple of, and I've, I never would have imagined you could do STEM demonstrations on 
virtually and keep people entertained for an hour. And oh my God, I was entertained for an hour yeah. because Ronnie's virtual demonstrations were just as good as his live demonstrations. And he was telling people, telling programs, things they could do with their students that were safe that and the students could still be doing science experiments. Uh, Calvin Mackey with STEM NOLA has taken his whole thing online. Uh, they're out of the Swasap region. I know Good News Travels is doing virtual uh, travel experiences every day. Uh, yesterday they did virtual Memphis. I think Thursday they're doing virtual New Orleans. Uh, don't forget your online tutoring services. A lot of them are are things we're needing right now and can help you virtually. And I know Mastery Prep has put a lot of test prep and different things online as well. So, you know, even though don't think of our vendors in a traditional way, they can work in non-traditional ways as well. Matt, I know, you know, with EOC, you all don't do a lot of these types of things, but do you have any vendors that you know of that have went virtual? Um, yeah, we don't really use vendors that much besides like Woodburn Press or, or um, you know, Proforma. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, if you're looking to do, I think Dr. George mentioned that you guys are having a conference coming up in November. Um, if you're looking to set up your conference and trying to figure out breakout sessions and stuff like that, WebEx is really good at doing that. And then invite these um, vendors and then have them go ahead and, you know, do their own breakout sessions kind of like we're doing today. Um, and then it's perfectly easy to use. And like Dr. George was saying, you know, Ronnie was amazing. Uh, I was always worried about, you know, his house and if he's going to set it on fire, but he did a great job. Uh, but it's always fun to look at it, but there are, you know, there's vendors out there. They still want, you know, to reach out to you. They can still help you and, and, and your, um, your colleagues um, with any type of thing that, you know, they're, they're able to offer. I'm not quite sure what is available in the EOA area. Um, but of course, you know, all of these will, will work just fine in that area as well. Okay. And I know we're approaching our hour, but we're going to talk about some innovative ways really quickly to, um, to uh, engage your students. And I know uh, Mr. Donovan is our uh, state we have what we call a COVID task force in Kentucky and the COVID task force puts on webinars just to talk about different things. And Matt, do you want to talk about the COVID task force that we started and kind of how that led to a webinar series? Because we've already talked about um, virtual tours, so we can skip that one. Sure. Um, yeah. So our state president asked me to chair the the COVID-19 response team kind of like you know the federal government I don't look like Mike Pence I'm a lot younger um <laughs> my hair's not gray yet but um but anywho so what I did was I was like okay well if we're going to create this COVID not just put out a, a newsletter or something like that you know let's actually have a webinar series to where we can get on there and kind of like what we're doing today we can talk about the most important things that you have to do to deal with COVID. So like um, I have a chair that, or um, one of my team members is Dr. George. He talks about COE and, and the department of ed and like, you know, what's going on, what, what are they saying? You know, what, how can I, you know, what, what my program needs to do, what type of information do I need to know? What's, a, you know, acceptable to buy, you know, how we're going to take our money um, and, and, you know, push it forward to next year. So he does that. Um, I also have one that is over like student initiatives. So they learn about how to reach out to students, um, you know, how to make sure that you're still keeping them engaged during this time of COVID, different ways you can do that. Um, I have uh, our president is a Red Cross certified mental health guy. And so mental health is huge in our time of COVID because we don't get that connection. We don't get that socialization. Um, and, you know, you're just sitting at home doing the same thing every day. Like Dr. George says, you may not even know what today is, you know? And so mental health is very important. So I had him do a mental health section during the webinar. Um, and then we talked about like student services and virtual tours you can do. Um, and then like social um, capital and you know how, why that's important and stuff like that. So it's just something that you can get out there. You can do maybe once a month. Um, we're having ours later um, in the month of July. Um, after just having it at the towards the end of June. So it's just something you go out there, you create a little, um, you know, like a Zoom series or something like that. And you just invite people and, and, you know, tell them about, you know, what's out there and how you can help and how you can be productive during the COVID times. 
Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we talked about virtual tours. Uh, one of the things we we did in the fall, uh, not in the fall, well, one of the things we did in March and April was we called what started what we called a conversation cafe or on Zoom every Wednesday night at five o'clock. We got online. The entire staff got online, sent it out to all of our students and a good way to do get uh, one. One other thing we didn't talk about, if you're a Blackboard campus, absolutely especially if you're an sss or mcnair go in and create a blackboard group if we hadn't had a blackboard group march and april would have been miserable because we had a blackboard group and we were able to push out mass announcements to our students so we go into our blackboard group every wednesday we would from four to five we would get online and we would just talk to the students what we found many of the students were missing their friends they were missing us I'm in the house with my grandparents now and I don't get to talk to anybody my age. I text with my friends, we FaceTime a little bit, but I just want some socialization with somebody besides my grandparents or I want some socialization besides somebody even then my brother and my sister. And our students were waiting for it. We did it for four weeks. We were just gonna do it for the final four weeks of the semester. We went to two extra weeks because the students asked, can we do it? I know you said we were stopping next week. Can we do it one more week? They wanted it. And we just talked and it was free for all. It was anything was fair game. Um, not necessarily talking about business, just talking about what's going on in the world, what's going on at home. I mean, you know, talk about, I talked to some of the guys about playing and girls about playing video games. Uh, one of the ladies who likes to sew was talking to some of the students about sewing. It, it was just, it was great. And the students loved it. And that is something a lot of people don't think about. And if we have to get in this situation again, you may want to do that. Uh, it's just a real talk conversations. And, you know, you get 10, 8, 10, 12 students get on and they can get on and get off as they want. Some of them would go, I'm going to get something deep, but I'll, they'll come back. And, you know, that's a good thing you could do. And we call it a conversation cafe. Um, also, we talk about tutoring. We realize very quickly a way to engage students. You got to still tutor them. Zoom tutoring works. <laughs> WebEx tutoring works. You know, you can get on there and you can see face to face and you can talk about it and you can screenshot stuff and you can make it work during um, Zoom and WebEx. Uh, if you're not doing a YouTube channel, that's something you ought to think about. And one of the things SEOP did that we loved and I know some programs ended up doing, COE just had a virtual graduation. Have an online house party. We say I hired a DJ one Friday night for the members. And everybody got on WebEx and the DJ played music and everybody was dancing and having a good time. Maybe you have an online house party or online social together. I know one of my staff members, I don't know how they play cards by Zoom. I've yet to figure that out, <laughs> <laughs> but they play cards and board games by Zoom. So, um, you know, build, really be innovative in how you engage your students. You've got a lot of great opportunities if you just think outside of the box. Um, Matt, I mean, we couldn't have timed this perfect. It is 11 <laughs> o'clock. That is one hour. I know Dr. Stewart said we had about an hour, hour and a half, and we had final thoughts at one hour. I'm, uh, uh, Dr. Stewart said the house party was fun. It was fun. <laughs> uh, so I, it was, it was, it was epic. I, and that was all of the Dr. Tracy Lyons thing, but it was epic. And I think uh, we're going to try to do one more, but Matt, final thoughts. Um, I would just say <clears throat> that don't think this stuff is going to go away. Um, you know, this is the new normal, like uh, our governor always says, this is the new normal that we're living in. So to embrace this digital world um, the quickest you can and to be most prepared is the way that you're going to be successful. And, you know, your students are going to be successful and your um, coworkers or employees are going to be successful. You know, we are in a digital age and we need to learn the proper ways to use that. Um, and so I'm just grateful that you guys had us on here. Um, you know, if you have any questions, um, ever want to reach out to me, I'm going to go ahead and type in my email address and feel free at any time to go ahead and reach out. And if you have anything you want to share um, or want me to share, you know, feel free to ask. I, I, I echo what Matt said. I appreciate my great friend, uh, my sister, Dr. Stewart, uh, asking us to do this. Uh, um, that I was humbled and honored when she asked us to do it and uh, so happy she allowed me to bring somebody else with me to make it even better. Uh, we love EOA, you know, EOA, y'all my folks, uh, for, whether it's uh, K. Monk Morgan, Roxanne Gregg, uh, EOA, Andrew Cedar, EOA, y'all my folks. So 
I don't know if anybody's on here. Laura, I don't know if Laura's on here, but yeah, EOA, y'all are my folks. So uh, I was honored to do this for you. I actually uh, hope one day I hope to get to come to one of your all's conferences because I think I hear, hear EOA is uh, awesome, awesome, awful, awesome conference. But I just tell everybody, be nimble, you know, be thinking outside the box, be ready. Because, I mean, I, I tell my staff probably on a, every, Monday, every Monday morning when we have our Zoom Monday morning meeting, they told us 48, it was 48 hours on March 11th. 48 hours. They, one, we were expecting the students to come back from spring break on Monday, that following Monday. That Monday, we were at the house. And we just had to reinvent ourselves and reinvent our program day to day. I mean... And we use tools and that what we had available to us. And now we think ahead. So be nimble because we don't know in a come September, quick 48 hours, they may say you're back at the house and you got to do this all over again. So think of all the stuff you can be doing to do it. Um, if you need anything from us, uh, let us know. I'm put, I'm typing my address in the box as well. Uh, we will share any thoughts with you or any ideas. And once again, I just appreciate the opportunity to um, present to you all today. And we'll turn it back over to EOA Technology. Thank you, Chris and Matt for your wisdom. Some of these things are just good to remember and listen to and remind ourselves that, oh yeah, we have some of these tools available to us um, and just to use them wisely. So we appreciate that. Um, on behalf of President Stewart, we want to thank you for joining us today uh, and a friendly reminder to complete your evaluation when you receive it in your email. We love to uh, provide you this service. So thanks so much. Everyone have a safe, happy holiday weekend and take care. <laughs>